Hey guys, so we've hit the fun point of the day where it's time to talk about water. Uh, my name's Scott. I think the first thing we should do is talk about why I'm here. So I'm here today and I've learned a lot about water because of my experiences at La Marzocco. So about two years ago, we were having an issue in the United States. We had more boiler failures in one city, Cambridge, Massachusetts, than the rest of the United States combined. With that, we really, of course, wanted to get the bottom of why do our boilers not like Cambridge, Massachusetts? So with that, we all decided to draw straws. I drew the short straw, and I got sent a bunch of textbooks on water. <laughs> Through that process, I actually came to learn that I really loved water. I loved the process, I loved the treatment, and figuring out what water does to metal is fascinating. So with that, I want to give you a little glimpse of what I learned and what you guys can do to use this in your own markets. So starting off, very simple premise that will guide us through the entire talk. This is what we care about, tasty coffee and healthy machines. As long as we have tasty coffee and healthy machines, nothing else matters. So with that, we're going to divide it up. First talk about tasty coffee. So to get tasty coffee, we first need to see a couple things. These four key terms. Now these four key terms are absolutely fantastic because they are our foundation, they are the structure. This is everything we need to know about really technical water stuff before we get into everything else. So what are the four current terms? TDS. TDS I think is a fairly well-known term in the coffee industry. What does TDS stand for? Total dissolved solids. What are total dissolved solids? They're just the stuff that's dissolved in the water. As it turns out, water is a universal solvent. That means you're never going to find water alone in its raw state. You're never going to find pure water. Water's always going to be hanging out with something else in it, in mixture. So with that, we have a very quick snapshot view of, hey, how much stuff is in mixture with water? Well, we can measure that. We measure that by TDS. So TDS, we talk about in parts per million. What's a part per million? If I were to have a weight to weight ratio of a million parts of water, how many parts of other things are in that water? Now, when we measure TDS, most of us are used to a little electric device that we put into the water and it pops up a number. That is called a conductivity meter. It's not actually measuring the amount of dissolved solids in total. It's measuring one specific type of dissolved solid, the type of dissolved solid that conducts electricity. And then it goes through a little math formula and gives you an estimation of what it thinks the total number of dissolved solids are, not just the conductive solids. So with that, if you're using a conductivity meter, it's really important to only use one brand and to use that same one over and over if you want to have your testing be completely repeatable. So TDS, nice little snapshot of what's going on in our water. Next up, hardness. Hardness is something that is generally thought of in the espresso machine world as the enemy. This is the stuff that will lead to scale in our machines. And we're not going to take such a simplistic view on this point. We're going to really come into this later on. But we're going to back up some. We have a cloud. It's hanging out there happy in the sky. Water starts to form little droplets and it falls. The first thing that happens with that falling water droplet it comes in contact with carbon dioxide, and it absorbs a little bit. Water plus CO2 equals carbonic acid. Now, that acid is going to lower the pH of our water. And when we do that, it means when the water falls into the ground, it's going to want to do something. It's going to want to react and pull that in. It's going to want to pull whatever it touches in. As it turns out, there are a couple of minerals calcium and magnesium specifically, that love to react with carbonic acid. When they react with carbonic acid, they enter the water and form what we'll see later on as all of these hardness minerals. Hardness minerals can be defined in two types, temporary and permanent. Temporary hardness is if you boil water, what's left behind. That's temporary hardness. It's removable. Permanent hardness is the stuff that carries off with the steam. That's permanent hardness. Together, that measurement is total hardness. So always remember what hardness you're measuring is very different and very important. So with that, 
we're moving on to what gets to be really fun, pH. pH is a baffling term. It stands for the potential of hydrogen. As it turns out, these little hydrogen molecules are really buggers to find. So we don't talk about how many there are. We talk about how many there potentially will be. And what we can say is, if there are more hydrogen molecules, there are going to be less of their opposite. And their opposite is hydroxide. So we have H positive on one side and OH negative on the other. And they're always going to be at some level of ratio between one to the other. If they're perfectly balanced, then we know we have a pH of 7. If we have more hydroxide, we know we have a pH going down. And if we have more hydrogen, we have a pH going up. And with that, well, why do we care? Well, the more hydroxide or the more hydrogen tells us the more of either one, the water's going to want to react. It's going to hang out and pull other things into solution with it. The less you have of any one extreme and the more balance your water has to it, the less it's going to want to react. And of course, we don't want water that reacts with anything, unless it's very specific for our coffee. So, we have a logarithmic scale, seven being neutral. And every time you go out, you multiply by a factor of 10. So a pH of five is far more reactive than a pH of six compared to a pH of seven, and so on as you move down the scale in each direction. So now, alkalinity was really the stumper for me. Alkalinity took me so long to figure out. So, if you open up any water textbook, you're going to read the same analogy over and over and over again. pH is the temperature of a room. Alkalinity is a measurement of how much energy it takes to change the temperature of that room. <laughs> that means nothing to me. So, pH tells us how much hydrogen versus hydroxide we have in a solution. Alkalinity is a measurement of the amount of bicarbonate. As it turns out, temporary hardness is that bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a buffer. It's the bouncer hanging out at the door that before you can go and mess with the pH guys, those hydrogens versus hydroxides, you have to deal with all of the bicarbonate. Bicarbonate must be consumed before you can change pH. Make sense? Way more sense than the temperature of a room changing and the energy required, right? Oh. Once I figured that out, water made a whole lot more sense. So, we have bicarbonate. Bicarbonate keeping any pH from changing. Let's, let's move back here. These are really, again, what we care about. Tasty coffee, healthy machines. So we have our foundational language. We have that structure of water, the four key terms. And let's get into the fun thing. In all reality, this is what we're here for. Or at least most of us are. I know I'm here for a tasty coffee. And as it turns out, we have some machines that make really tasty coffee. So how do we maximize this? We maximize it with a solvent lacking impurities. So, at the most basic level, we have a solvent, water. We have a solute, ground coffee. We create an extraction by running a solvent through a solute. And we get a tasty beverage known as coffee. That's it. That's all we do. Solvent, solute. With that, if we have any impurities in there, if we start with something that doesn't taste good in the beginning, and it doesn't react with anything, it's going to taste bad at the end. So, we need to optimize our solvent and make sure we don't have any impurities. So let's talk about the solvent. So this is the TIE fighters attacking the Death Star. Now tying that to water is going to be, it actually has nothing to do with TIE fighters and Star Wars. It has a lot to do with the transient phase of brewing. So this is the most interesting part of the whole brew process. This is what we all do every day. We're all looking for this. So, First thing that happens, ground coffee, pour water over it. Those coffee, little coffee particles start to swell. Awesome. We have it swelling there. Now, what happens next? This is the magic of coffee. We have the soluble acids start to go into solution and make their way, so those acids are positively charged, so we can see them as the pluses, making their way to the surface. And we have, in the espresso process, insoluble substances hydrolyzing due to pressure. With that, 
we have a rate at which they can get to the surface. Because once they're at the surface, we're just washing them away. And once we wash them away, that's just in the cup. Fairly well accepted, the faster we can get everything into our cup, the better the coffee's gonna taste. We wanna have a optimized speed of extraction. And to do that, we need to get all of our, what I like to call tasty nuggets, out to the surface as fast as we can. So, looking at those tasty nuggets, or the organic acids that are flavor, much easier called tasty nuggets. Those tasty nuggets, their rate of coming to the surface of the coffee grab, little particle, is caused by the alkalinity in the water. The um, amount of bicarbonate in the water dictates how fast tasty nuggets come to the surface, and the faster the tasty nuggets come to the surface, the better our coffee will taste. Because we'll have more tasty nuggets and less of the non-tasty nuggets, or the less than tasty nuggets in our coffee. So, how does alkalinity control extraction rate? Two ways. It can slow it down and it can speed it up. And when we have water that has no alkalinity to it, the puck doesn't expand. CO2 isn't released. And when you don't have that, the puck has too little resistance, water passes through, and you're unable to hydrolyze your insoluble compounds. On the other side, if you have too many bicarbonates in your water, then the rate of extraction will actually be slowed down. So we need to optimize that. How do we optimize it? We put about 40 to 75 parts per million of bicarbonates of alkalinity in our water. With that, we'll have an optimized rate of extraction. So, that was a lot right there. Like, we just got real. So, we're going to go and talk about something as important but much easier. Impurities. So, who here likes nice, healthy drinking water that will not get them sick? So, do you know how we get that? That stinky stuff called chlorine. It's brilliant. It keeps our water safe. I would much rather have water that stinks a little bit than water that destroys me. So, we put chlorine in the water. We have to take it out if we don't want that in our final beverage. There's a whole list of impurities. E.E. E. Lockhart found this list, made this list in the 1950s. You can still find it, it's easily accessible. Look there, if you have an off flavor in your water, remove it. And we'll talk about how to remove it later on. So, tasty coffee, healthy machines. I think we've hit the tasty coffee part pretty well. Now we're gonna talk about the part that Ricardo here cares about, healthy machines. He wants to keep his warranty costs down. And to do that, we need to make sure our water is gonna have healthy machines. You gotta smile a little bit, buddy, come on. <laughs> see, 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 you. E. <laughs> All right, so, healthy machines. How do we make our machine healthy? The most basic, basic question. How do we make sure that we're not submitting warranty claims to Ricardo that he's gonna say, hey, your water isn't quite right? Balance. So, we're gonna talk about two things here. Now, these two things aren't directly 100% tied all of the time, but as it turns out, we're just making coffee. We're not creating the water for the cooling tower of a nuclear power plant, so we can cut a couple corners. I'm sorry, we're cutting corners. We just make coffee. It's okay. So, we're going to look at two different things, scale and corrosion. We always want to have a happy medium between scale and corrosion. What is scale? Crystalline formation of carbonates and bicarbonates in places of temperature and pressure change. That differential is what causes temperature and scale to form. So, three places. Elements, boiler walls, flow restrictors. Those are the three places with the most temperature and pressure change. So, with that, we really want to look at two different problems. First problem, inefficiency of heating. If we put a nice rock blanket on our heating elements, we're going to have to heat up that rock before we heat up our water. And if we're spending a lot of energy heating up rock, we're clearly not going to have a very reactive, fast temperature system. And because of that, we just spent a lot of money on a machine that isn't that temperature stable. On the other side, reduced flow and irregular flow. As a barista 
This was the bane of my existence. When I had one group that flowed fast and one group that flowed slow, the technician told me I was crazy, told me there's no difference, the pressure is the same, it doesn't matter if the pressure is the same, the flow has to be the same. As it turns out, it doesn't. And that change in flow means I'm never going to make the same coffee between my groups. And God, that drove me insane. And here I am now talking about water. So, to keep that from happening to other baristas, those are the two things we care about. So, when we talk about scale, we're talking about a material lining on our boiler walls, on our heating elements, and our places of flow restriction. But, we're going to talk about the other side now. So, um, nobody here is in sales, so it's okay if I say this. Everyone dies and everything breaks. It's a sad reality of life. So, how do we get our 316 stainless steel, 316L stainless steel that Ricardo worked so hard to have perfect in our boilers? Well, we take a lot of ores, we get them really hot. We melt them, and we pour them out. Now we have 316L stainless steel. From the second we pour that stainless steel out and start to let it cool, all it really wants to do is go back to its natural state. It wants to go back and become an ore. All metal, all of these nice man-made metals, just want to go back to their natural state as an ore. All metal corrodes. I'm sorry. Your work is temporary, not permanent. But that's OK, because the permanence of that metal depends on how we treat it. And man, we can make it last for a whole long time as long as we treat it well. And with that, we're going to talk about the things that, first off, define what corrosion does. Defines, define what causes corrosion. So, the key things. pH of the solution. So, the more reactive the water is, or solution in general, the more likely it is to react with our metal. Done. Easy. We can control for that. Next one. Oxygen in solution adjacent to that metal. Really interestingly, you need oxygen to make coffee taste good. I've tried it without. It's really easy to deoxygenate water to make the machines last far longer. But apparently that tasty coffee thing is really important. We want to focus on that so we can't deoxygenate our water. Next thing. Specific nature and concentration of other ions in the solution. That's a weird one. It sounds kind of funny. Put an asterisk next to it. We're going to come back to that. We all have the asterisk there? Awesome. If you live in Cambridge, you already know what that asterisk may be. So, now, the next one. This is the one that fascinates me. The ability of the environment to, perform, to form a protective layer between water and metal. So, water corrodes metal. Done. But... If we have something between water and metal, it's not going to corrode. <sighs> Mind blown. Maybe scale isn't the enemy we've always thought it was. Maybe there's a healthy amount of scale. There's scale that doesn't cause too much inefficiency of heating and does not cause reduced or irregular flow but does keep that pesky water away from our precious metal. Well, that's an interesting idea. Let's go back. We have an idea that we know what we want for tasty coffee. We know we want a healthy machine. We have a pretty clear idea now that we want water that will form a little bit of scale, that will protect our precious metal from the water we need as a solvent to make our beautiful coffee. So, we need to start quantifying things here. So the first step in that is, let's figure out what balance of scale we need. Because too much is clearly a problem. So, looking at this, if anybody pulls out their phone and opens up Wikipedia right now, they will clearly see that the Langlier saturation index is technically not a measure of corrosion. It is only a measure of scale formation. 
Let's back up a second here. What the hell is the Langlier Saturation Index? Well, this guy named Wilford Langlier in 1936 was working for UC Berkeley. His project was to figure out how water forms scale, at what rate it forms scale in municipal pipes in Berkeley. Because that equation would let them tweak the water to not have scale form in those municipal pipes. Brilliant. He created this index where zero is balance. Zero is zero scale formation. Positive, logarithmically, means more scale formation. Negative means likelihood of non-scale formation. Nothing forming. Well, with that, we're going to use this a little bit off-brand here. Technically, that side isn't corrosion. It's lack of scale formation. In my experience in the United States with La Marzocco's, there has yet to be a boiler failed that doesn't have an asterisk next to it that has not had a negative LSI value, Langlier Saturation Index value. If you're building a $100 million water treatment plant for a nuclear cooling plant, you don't want to just sort of kind of use this number. You want to do millions and millions of dollars worth of math because you got a couple billion dollars worth of nuclear power behind you. We're making coffee. So we're going to use some easier math. So what does this math look like? So, oh man. Um, as it turns out, I work in coffee. And because of that, this is very difficult for me to do. Um, yeah. So, quantifying the LSI is hard. And we'll get to an answer to that later on. But right now, guys, here's the magic number. Everybody pull out your notebooks. This is what you came here to hear. 0 0.3, 0 .0, uh, 0 .3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. That LSI range will give us positive scale formation, but is not likely to form enough scale to cause heating issues or flow issues. That's the magic number. So, you guys all have a magic number. Let's go to this asterisk. So, there are actually two asterisks I want to talk about. First one, chlorides. If you're in a place where there happens to be a lot of salt in your water table, like say Perth, Australia, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, salt loves the taste of metal. Done. Nothing you're going to do about it except for remove the salt. So, chlorides are one of our asterisks. There's another one. This is the health and safety one. Aggressive water. Water that has an agree aggressively, a very negative LSI number is going to be hungry for something, anything. It wants to pull things out of metal. As it turns out, lead and nickel are the two easiest things to be pulled out of nickel. And because of that, we all should give Roberto, uh, Roberto and Ricardo a round of applause because you'll see more and more in the Marzocco machines, less copper and brass that contain lead and nickel are in the machine. The pump just changed from brass to stainless steel to ensure that with any aggressive water, there's no chance of getting lead or nickel into our solvent, because that's one dangerous solvent to ingest later on. So we get aggressive water. We get chlorides. We have that asterisk down. All right. We've gotten tasty coffee. We've gotten healthy machines. We know what number we want. Well, how do we go from here? We need to do something I call an informed action. We know what we need in our water. We're going to test our water. So to do this, we're going to talk about something that's been a year and a half of work for me and Ricardo. This is something that I think we're both very proud of, a fuzzy photo. So this is the La Marzocco water test kit. Starting in January, every machine you receive from La Marzocco will have a six parameter water test kit. With that, you just have to circle some numbers, simple dip strips. Use them, 
circle the numbers, and then you're going to know what your water values are. And then all you have to do is this, right? I mean, me and Ricardo can do it. Why aren't you guys going to? Oh. <laughs> so we, we get that math sucks. So we built this. This is where the magic happens. You plug those six values into this table. You hit submit. The calculated LSI will come up, and then you'll scroll down, and you'll see this. This is what we recommend you use to reach that LSI value that will be between 0 .03, uh, uh, 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. That's it. That's what you have to do to get water that will be safe for your machine. So from there, we have tasty coffee, we have healthy machines, we know what we need to, how we need to condition our water. And I just realized actually we need to change this. We're not just filtering our water, we're conditioning our water. Filtration is one limited thing. And as it turns out, that's what we're talking about next. So we know what we need to do. Why are we doing it and what does it do? To keep from being duped because, let's be honest, a lot of people who sell water filtration mostly sell snake oil and lies. So, types of filtration. Three broad categories. We add something, we take something away, or we exchange something. So, what happens when we add something? There are going to be two segments. First one is chloride, uh, sorry, calcite. Calcite is a trade name. It's just a fancy name that everybody in the water filtration business uses to say calcium carbonate. It's a way of injecting minerals into our water. If we have water that needs more minerals to it, we add calcite to our water. Second form is polyphosphate. What is polyphosphate? Has anybody ever seen a water softener? Um, and these are a couple different types. These are the ones that say scale inhibition, scale inhibitor. Usually they're found in big bowls, they're white sticks, and they cost a lot of money. So those scale inhibitors are chemicals that grab on to the calcium carbonate and hang out with it and keep it from sticking anywhere. That's awesome. However, up until the latest generation of scale in inhibitors, they did not even work at 200 degrees. Wow, how much money have we spent on those? They don't work at above 200 degrees Fahrenheit. No, sorry, not Celsius. So over 90 degrees Celsius don't work. The newest generation works up to boiling point. However, with that, they only work for about 30 minutes. Well, that does a whole lot of good, right? I mean, I know I replace all my water in my machine every 30... No, I don't do that. Scale inhibitors don't do anything for an espresso machine. For an ice machine, they're great. For a soda fountain, they're great. For places that don't have this extreme heat or long holding times, totally acceptable. But those expensive white sticks that you've been putting in your water filter for your espresso machine... Well, it, you know that sludge you get at the bottom of your boiler? That sludge is your polyphosphate you're paying so dearly for. Doesn't do that much. Gotta love the water filter, guys. So, moving on to a positive note. Subtraction. Who here has made pasta? And I, I mean the most basic, I boil water, I put dry things in, I pour it through a strainer. All right. You guys are all masters of filtration. What you're doing is filtering. You're filtering out water and pasta. So with that, I'm going to realize that I'm not actually showing you the nice little graphic. So two types. Absorption. Absorption is really my favorite type. Look at a piece of Velcro. We have this big old piece of Velcro hanging out. And we have some nasties going by our water. 
let's say chlorine being one of these nasties, it gets stuck in the Velcro and doesn't move on. That is absorption. Activated carbon filters are absorption. They're cheap, they're easy, they're brilliant. They make water taste great. Taste and odor filtration is activated carbon. What you buy when you buy more expensive activated carbon is you buy more surface area. Surface area is the name of the game in activated carbon. The longer water runs through car activated carbon, the more ability you have for that Velcro to pull everything out. Make sense? Awesome. Let's go to the really simple kind, back to pasta analogy. So, mechanical filtration is just removing solids with a screen. A couple degrees of that, from the biggest degree, which is going to be our pasta, to the mid degree, which is our five micron pre-filter. That just takes all the sort of junk that may flow through, not going to hurt us, just doesn't look that good, may clog something. Five micron mechanical filter. Hyper degree, the finest, finest, finest filtration we can get. And this is a little bit of a simplification, but reverse osmosis. When we run water through a little capillary tube, so small that only the little hydrogen and oxygen molecule can fit through, nothing else can. Coming out the other side, hydrogen and oxygen. Everything on the previous side, everything else in our water, all filtered through. So, exchange. This is the really fun one. And by fun, I mean, this one gets weird, quick. So, we have calcium carbonate. We know calcium carbonate has two positive signs next to it. We don't actually know that, but I'm telling you now so you know. It's got two positive signs next to it. That means it's going to want to stick to our boiler walls really badly. What we can do is change the calcium for Na, sodium, to make sodium carbonate. As it turns out, that only has one positive sign next to it and doesn't want to stick to our boiler walls as much. Awesome. How do we do that? An ion exchange softener. These ion exchange softeners are fine for healthy machines. But they're not optimized. They're not giving you a better cup of coffee. They actually may detract from your cup of coffee because sodium and coffee don't get along. It extends the brew time by a huge amount. Sodium softeners usually mean less quality coffee, but they mean a healthy machine and far less expense than reverse osmosis. So in some cases, softening is a better and more economical option compared to reverse osmosis. For the highest quality of coffee, however, reverse osmosis, usually when you need to reduce mineral levels, is the optimum way. So, with that, we're 33 minutes in, and I can say thank you guys very much.